Okay. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Very pleased to have one of our local Berkeley lab friends with us, Miriam Kieran. She's a research scientist with a joint position in ESNet and CRD. In CRD, she works in the Scientific Data Management Group. And her work specific is on um, using advanced software and machine learning techniques to advance system architectures, particularly high-speed networks. Um, she's also the recipient of an early career award from Oscar in 2017. So whenever you're ready, Mary. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you again. Uh, so it's been some time since I've done a talk to internally. So um, so this is a work which so which we're doing under the Oscar grant, uh, but it's two years in, so we still have three more years to go. So uh, but we've had some recent results and I wanted to present what we have so far. So, uh, so the, okay, somebody's. That was me, okay. sorry, just ignore me. So, uh, so in this work, we're going to be talking about how we're experimenting with time series prediction, particularly to do with network traffic. Um, so the outline of the talk is, I'm gonna start off by talking about how we see the future of networks and how it will leverage AI techniques to actually optimize how we currently use our high-speed networks. Uh, in particular, I'm talking about wide area networks, but the techniques we develop for wide area networks can be transferred to IoT and even smaller kinds of networks. So we look at network traffic prediction as a classical problem, and we've been experimenting with various statistical techniques and deep learning techniques and various models to see how we can improve the predictions and actually anticipate what kind of traffic we will be getting on ESNet before we make any optimal decisions. Uh, so the last part is how, so once we've got the algorithms working, we actually need to deploy them into production and somehow link them in with the tools so that we can actually leverage the decisions coming in from the AI. So we've been building, um, a platform or a complete infrastructure which is hosted on GCP, our Google Cloud platform. And I'll talk about some of the ways in which we've done it, where we can actually deploy multiple models in the wild and test them with real time traffic as it comes in uh, on the network. So uh, just a background. Um, so I uh, lead a team where I'm trying to leverage AI to aid ne network research. So we are uh, looking at various aspects of this, such as predicting how our network reso resources are being used, which goes from routers, switches, how the bandwidths are gonna look like in the future, and also how we can turn our network devices into self-learning devices. So we're leveraging a lot of deep reinforcement learning uh, to actually work with the devices. So the controllers look at what is happening on the network and then they change their behavior and how they see uh, fit. So uh, a lot of these approaches have deep learning in it, but the, the key difference is a lot of the data we work with is system logs, time series logs, error reporting logs, no images at all uh, so far. Um, so that's the unique challenge we find in our machine learning approaches that we need to work with very boring sets of very large data sets. Um, so this is a picture of how uh, ESNet does capacity projections so this is showing a graph since 1990 uh, and predicting what the traffic is gonna look like next year, 2020. And we see that uh, over the years, we've always had like an exponential growth of traffic and we have a 62% growth every year of traffic, uh, which is on uh, DOE. So obviously it has a lot of operational challenges such as managing the scale and different kinds of heterogeneity. We see this new era where a lot of AI workloads are gonna be running on our um, networks and obviously super facility as well. So with an anticipated growth of 103 petabytes in maybe March, 2019, how can we address these challenges from an infrastructure point of view and make sure that um, the network doesn't go down uh, ever. So a lot of ESNet 6 efforts, which uh, I am currently not part of, but uh, I'm on the side off, are concentrated on addressing the scalability challenge. So they're looking at it from a very core network uh, perspective, network engineering perspective, and how they can update the current uh, network environment to actually cope with these. My work sits on the side where I'm just trying to see where we can bring in AI and leverage that within ESNet 6 and possibly push it, push the border a bit further. Um, 
So if we look at, um, so with that anticipated growth, if we look at the current bandwidth usage on ESnet, this is a graph which shows you the uh, bandwidth usage of the whole of 2019 from January to December. And I plotted a histogram of what was the capacity being used of the links at, at the, uh, during the whole year. And what it shows is that most of the year, only 40% of the links are, high, uh, are the ones which are used. There are only some links which go above 40%, and these are particularly transatlantic links. And they always, they sometimes also go above one, such as they have very high traffic, which goes on to the backward, uh, the back, uh, uh, the backup links as well. Now, a reason why this is, is because the network is designed uh, to have, to go up to 40%. So we do have a cap. And the reason is because we do see a lot of bursty traffic on our networks. So we have to count for the sudden burst. So there is a sudden big data transfer coming from uh, CERN all the way to LBNL and can, can there be enough space on the network to actually uh, cope with that extra burst. So with all of that, we also provide very high quality of service. So we are known for being a lossless network uh, compared to AT&T and other providers. And we do uh, uh, up, uh, specialize in delivering big data sans transfers as well. So we monitor separately. We have a number of monitoring tools on the network where we can monitor loss, uh, throughput, and then you can also monitor what kind of traffic data, uh, the amount of data is moving from different links across it. So the question we're posing is that given this is the current infrastructure, can we run the networks hotter? So right now we are optimized to go up to a 40%. Can we do something where we can go up to 100% with the current infrastructure we have? So some of the inspirations we uh, draw are from operational wide area networks, which include Google and Microsoft. So they have the seminal papers in 2013 where they uh, discussed their ways in which they have optimized their networks and gone up to 100%. A lot of those, uh, so there are very common themes in those papers which talk about central decision making and uh, with an optimization function. So they monitor what is happening currently on the network and they have a lot of interesting optimization to actually move traffic from one link to the other to demonstrate that we can actually go up our network utilization. However, what happens is that those solutions are specifically designed for their networks and they are not transferable to our networks. That's one issue. The other issue is that um, uh, these networks work with applications which they have designed themselves. We work with networks where our applications are written by scientists. So we usually don't see uh, what an application is doing on the network until it actually interfaces with the network. So, um, and also DOE traffic tends to be uh, very varied from very large bursts to very small uh, file transfers with our, which are many in number. So the traffic nature is very different, uh, particularly because we deal with science data sets. So that brings the motivation for this work. Uh, so, Current approaches which we follow in ESnet have, or in wide area networks, have to do with manual configuration. So they rely on standard routing parameters which uh, come from experiences of network engineers. And usually the most robust algorithms are the shortest path calculating algorithms. Um, now the challenge which these algorithms have is that they can potentially lead to a number of congestion points. So we have situations where there are certain links which are always hot or very highly utilized, but at the same time, there is another uh, part of the network which are not being used at all. So these are underutilized links, uh, but have many in number. But because of the way the routing algorithm works, those are, those are usually not selected. So we want to see if we can use prediction to actually do intelligent routing decisions. So uh, try to un, uh, utilize these underutilized links, see if we can actually move more traffic on the current network we have, so allow basically more science uh, as possible, so we don't have to wait for uh, a particular slot where the network will be good. We should be able to utilize what we have and also uh, use traffic prediction patterns to actually work out if this path is not being used right now, can we just use it, even though it's not what the shortest possible route uh, as a result. So we drew inspiration from Google Maps here. Uh, 
So this was an idea which, um, uh, so our director had this idea, so credit goes to him. So, um, so we were thinking about how Google Maps actually does this, where you can put in a source and a destination, and it gives you what the next 24 hours is gonna look like. And based on the graph you have, you can choose which slot uh, you wanna do your travel on. And you can also get real-time uh, updates. So there is an accident on a particular road or there is congestion on certain uh, roads. And you can choose different paths based on this. So what we want to do is we want to bring that inspiration and those ideas into our, uh, our system here. So we're tapping into all real-time data which ESNet has right now, such as persona logs, which are monitoring the loss happening on the network, traffic statistics coming from the SNMP router interfaces, we also have access to NetFlow uh, logs, and also we can use all of this to actually give you a transfer completion time. So based on the prediction uh, results, it would tell you that if you do the transfer within this slot, your transfer will be finished in the next five hours. Or something. So that would allow us to actually build up a number of workflows in that process. So that's the golden, uh, the, uh, golden prize at the end. So the way we uh, handle this Google map idea is to uh, leverage the time series predictions. So we take in current uh, network traffic statistics coming from every router, and then we try to predict what the next 24 hours is gonna look like in the form of bar graphs. Uh, what uh, this is focused on is just 24 hours right now, but we can expand it further. But right now we're trying to see what are the just-in-time paths we can take? So basically, we're trying to create, solve the traffic engineering problem, which um, and look at other patterns where we can reduce congestion and optimize how we are currently utilizing it. Another way of looking at it is that if you see what the next 24 hours is going to look like, engineers can make intelligent decisions that okay, I can turn, uh, I can, I can uh, not turn, but they can actually leverage which which particular particular links they want to experiment with in the next 24 hours because it's going to be less busy, for example. So they can do software upgrades, hardware upgrades, anything. And then plus, if we have predictions for the next 24 hours, we can also link it in with raising alarms. So uh, that introduces a lot of network automation capability, which can uh, alert the engineers if a sudden traffic is happening on the network, which we didn't anticipate, uh, et cetera. So the problem we found is that networks are actually very noisy. So uh, this graph basically just shows you the transatlantic links um, from ESNet. And this is the total traffic in the year 2018. So we see that all of this is very noisy. It's very difficult to predict what the season seasonality in this data is. There is also a lot of missing data because some of the switches were not working or the routers were turned off and there was some issue over there. So um, actually working with this data is a little bit of a problem. So we investigated like various methods. We started with statistical methods first, and then we moved on to deep learning as we got a bit more mature in our research. Uh, so we tested ARIMA, Holt Winters, and Sarima approaches, and then we moved on to deep learning. So I'm now going to go into um, the, uh, the results we got from the prediction algorithms themselves. So a lot of literature analysis was done before we started. So uh, we did find that there is no application of uh, time series on real network data. And the reason for this is because network data is difficult to get. And being an ESNet, we have the, the, the luxury of having access to these data sets. So it gave us uh, a good plus point that we can actually test our algorithms with real time data, with real network data. Um, so statistical methods are good, but they are difficult to tune and scale. And there is a lot of pre stuff which you have to do to make sure that those statistical methods would work. So we found a lot of literature which sometimes supported uh, statistical methods, especially if you had seasonal patterns in your data sets. But then more recent work is uh, supporting a lot of deep learning approaches because they can learn much more complex data sets um, and also reduce the processing time. So this is the kind of traffic we use. So all of the data is time series traffic statistics. So every uh, router uh, interface has this kind of uh, uh, 
a monitoring tool which can actually record the number of gigabytes moving in and out from the, from the router. That is recorded in gigabytes uh, and it is recorded at 30 second intervals. So we collected this data from ESNet. We also found open source data sets from UC San Diego who does a lot of internet research. And we also found the internet backbone data uh, from Japan and US. So we used all of these data statistics to actually test out our machine learning models. Um, so we first started by looking at seasonality. So what we found uh, is here that with Arima, you need to, so what are, the way Arima works is that it converts your time series into a stationary series, and which basically means that it assumes that there is uh, your mean and your variances is stable. And it's much more of a linear regression approach. Uh, if your data is not stationary, then this algorithm fails. In Holt Winters, it assumes that there is a trend in seasonality in your data and also it smooths it out. The way our network traffic is up and down, up and down, up and down, so that smoothing thing actually does not work very well with our predictions. The best uh, results we found were with Sarima in these approaches, and this was because it had additional four variables, which include seasonality into our data sets. Uh, so we have a few results on sh uh, using Sarima for over here. Uh, we also experimented and we are still experimenting with Fourier transforms, which basically takes your time series data and converts it into a frequency domain data, which is a series of sine curves and cosine curves. And what uh, we did this was basically if you once you convert it into a frequency curve, you can filter out the low amplitudes and the high frequency components. So this also smooths out your data which makes it easy to then predict. But again, in all of these approaches, what we found is you're smoothing out your network traffic. Um, so they, they do require periodicity if these techniques have to work. So uh, we can also do things where you can find what the trend in, uh, is in your data set or what the seasonality patterns are. You can also work out how much noise you have in the data using these techniques and actually filter that out. So all of this reduce, uh, allows us to smooth that out and you can actually improve your predictions if you were working with that kind of data set and if that was your goal. Um, the pro another problem we had was a lot of our data looks like this where we have missing data sets uh, in, the, in the box over here. Um, so statistical predictions do not work well because of the nature of our data. So we are very, very uh, random. We don't actually have a lot of seasonality from what uh, our analysis showed. And these missing data sets means that if, even if we smooth the data sets out, we're actually getting a lot of prediction errors uh, when we use these techniques. Um, so this is, uh, so Sarima was the one which was able to give us pretty good results in that sense. So uh, we did a lot of uh, pre-tuning of the variables. So the way we did it is that every link, ESNet has 140 links in total which connects all of more than 70 DOE sites and universities. So we looked at traffic per link and we built a model per link. So that means we had 140 models. Uh, so we did a lot of pre-tuning of all the models. Uh, we did research uh, using the Siri max function here. What the advantage of this approach is it gives you confidence intervals which grow further as you go down the future. So they, these are good if you want to have those confidence intervals in your predictions. However, again, because we have sudden traffic bursts, these are still difficult to anticipate. Uh, Sarima was also able to give us this result. Uh, so this is a sudden burst, which we had in May 2018. Uh, so we took that data set and we plotted a correlation matrix of all the links active at that time. So what it showed is that whenever there was a burst, the burst was on this link, which was the Sacramento-Denver link, there was a corresponding burst on the Denver-Kansas link. So we can actually build up relationships using this kind of algorithm that whenever there is a burst on one thing, this is the effect which, or the traffic flow where it's gonna have on the other links at that time. Um, you have different models on every link, but each one, they're not really independent. They were able to learn that each one had access to the data of all the others. No, they were pretty independent. So they were only looking at their own links. Okay, so somehow it's still able to get these yeah. correlations. Yeah, so this was, so sorry, we did a multivariate analysis for this. So that's how this worked out, this correlation. So the same data, did you have some slight window or did you forget the past or did you learn everything and it was just one time learning for given time slots? We had a sliding window. 
So we moved and we kept moving up as we, uh, that was 24 hours. Um, yeah, so from these statistics, after experimenting with these statistical approaches, we actually decided to go down the deep learning route. So uh, the assumption was that deep learning can allow us to learn more features because we don't have any seasonality and each link was behaving differently. Um, so we did see seasonality in some links and other links were not seasonal at all. Um, so what we did was we combined features such as, we, we wanted to combine features such as conference times and weekends with our traffic data to see if that would improve uh, the predictions. And deep learning could allow us to add more features in that. So uh, the way we did it is we treated our time as discrete sequences. So all of our time was con converted into hourly intervals. And then we had discrete values for every hour. And then we built an LSTM uh, model for those. Uh, and with those, we also added features such as the time of the day, uh, uh, what, what hour of the day it was, if it was a weekday or a weekend. So right now we just added these features and we tried to see how the LSTM models were improving. Um, so we did start, to start with recurrent neural networks. Uh, we, there is a problem with recurrent neural networks that it cannot learn because we have the sliding window technique. Uh, there is a vanishing gradient problem with RNNs. So it wasn't able to capture long term what was happening. So we switched to LSTMs and that does give you a better prediction. So by default, uh, we should always do LSTMs if you're trying to do time series predictions because you can track long, uh, long time periods in this. So, we, uh, so when we prepared the data, we binned it into hourly uh, intervals. And this was the moving window technique where we used batches. So the batches were used as a mo moving window to actually train our LSTM as we moved forward. Um, looking at literature, a number of LSTM models were discussed. So again, there is a plethora of different models which everybody kind of tends to come up with. So there is uh, some papers we found where just one LSTM would be the best approach, two LSTMs would be better or a stacked LSTM. And then uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, support for sequence to sequence learning, which is actually encoding, putting in an auto encoder in the middle of various LSTM layers because it allows you to learn features. So what we wanted to do was to test which, uh, so again, this is not an architect, so this turned into like which architecture is best for this kind of an experiment. So we wanted to test which architecture would be the best. Um, so just a little bit on sequence to sequence uh, approaches. So this has been favored as one of the best approaches because they've used it to predict what uh, video frames are gonna look like in the future based on what the current techniques are. And also it's been very successful in text translation. So we wanted to see whether it works well with uh, time series prediction as well. So the way it works is that you have an input set and then you have a forecast. So again, not to inc uh, an encoder uh, part and a decoder part. And then you move uh, data between those two and in the end you learn a thought vector, which is the learned representations. And then you use this thought vector to actually forecast what the next future is gonna look like. So uh, this allows you to do look back and extract useful features because you're actually compressing the data and then expanding it. So you only draw out what is relevant. Uh, and then, yeah, you use that to do forecasting given the input data set. So uh, hyperparameter tuning became a big issue for us because we were working with 140 link traces with 140 independent models. The way we did it is that we had a predefined set of parameters. So the number of neurons were say between these three sets of uh, thing. We had a batch size between these two values. We experimented with different dropout layers, hidden layers and how many neurons we defined in those. And then we already were experimenting with different LSTM architectures, adjust the number of layers we were using. The lesson we learned from this is that uh, this is essentially a multi-objective optimization problem because there are too many variants in an LSTM model. So we do have to go down a Bayesian approach or genetic algorithm to actually learn what the optimal hyperparameters are per model. Uh, right now, this is a scaling issue for us because we have too many models we have to train. Um, so we are now going into, I'm working with Judy uh, to see if we can build an LDRD around this problem where we can do this. Can you clarify, so that 
hundred foot models for hundred foot buildings, and now for every link, you are trying to find the different hyperparameter values. Because every data is different, so the the model it has to be suited to the data it, it is working with. So you could make a model bigger. Does that feel more or less the inline? So just so that's so I'm going to come to that next. Yeah. In this non-LSM project, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which I assume at the end, maybe, but have you tried like convolutional neural networks and? Uh, right? No, right now we're just working with LSTMs. Uh, yeah. So uh, to uh, a precursor to your answer is that we once we trained every kind of variant, we found that different variants were giving better results for different. Uh, links. And the reason for this is because of the different nature of the links themselves. It depends on the site characteristics, the kind of traffic which is moving on those, uh, on those links. So we cannot come up with one model which is best for all links. Yes? Sure. How much data point would you have actually for one link? For one whole year. So uh, 360. No, uh, 8,000. So we converted one here into one hour intervals. Uh, so 8,640. But you said there were bugs for 24. So did you just move back by one hour? And put, so they were overlapping batches? They were, no, they were distinct batches. So that is just 360 days? Yeah, for okay, so, the whole year. So this is how many batches? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the model comparison, performance comparison we have here. Uh, so we did this across multiple links. Uh, this is a very busy table, but I wanna focus on just two columns over here. Uh, so we compared our results with the traditional ARIMA in the whole winter's approaches and the different variants we were experimenting with. Uh, so in particular, the IOFA London Inverts uh, link had very strong seasonality compared to the other links. So in those cases, we actually got a better result from the statistical approach. Uh, in Washington CERN uh, inward link, uh, we had a lot of problem with the data collection because there were a lot of uh, empty spaces uh, in the data set which we collected. So in those approaches, again, the models were not performing very well. Yes. Can you define the loss? How you compute the loss? The mean square error. So we oh, did okay, a- because, so, so this is not tricky because you I'm working with the spikes from neurons. So computing the loss for spike response is tricky because you may have a spike which is just shifted by one mean, and then your high square, I mean, the loss going over the roof. But for the human, it said, okay, I just missed 20 minutes. The spike is just later. But you penalize it very heavily. So how do you deal with this? I, so I don't understand. So, okay, so the, let's the... say that one, one, the truth is a spike here. And your prediction has exactly this effect that the spike is one bit farther, one hour later. Yeah. So this spectra for a human, okay, it's not bad. I just missed the offset. Yeah. But for the loss is 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 fragile, right? Yeah, so we uh yeah, so we we use the standard, we didn't do like from a human perspective that if the prediction is a little later, uh we didn't consider it that. Yeah. So maybe that's a good suggestion we can try to work on next. So thank you. Um so in most of the approaches, we do find that LSTMs are better at learning certain patterns, uh, and each link does behave differently. Uh, a, a much more graphical representation just to show how uh, the thing works. So again, there is a lot of randomness to deep learning. Every time you run it, you'll get a different result. So we had to average multiple runs to get, uh, uh, so here we did it just three times and just plot the prediction results. LSTMs tend to flatline quite a lot if you try to bootstrap as you go further into the future. So they have uh, first two links, uh, first two points, it will go up and down and then it'll just flatline. If, uh, so the way we solve that is basically just add more training data. So the more training data LSTMs were able to learn those patterns up and down, up and down, up and down better, um, which prevented it from flatlining in the future. Uh, there were a lot of parameters to tweaks. So we had a student who was working with us last year, um, and what she did was she basically just compared the different activation functions. So took out sigmoid, uh, replace it with soft act, uh, soft max, tanh, relu, and then she tried to see what the mean square error varied with all of those activation functions as well as, and we found that uh, the best one was for, with tanh activation functions. 
So again, there are so many variants uh, that we can play around with to actually make your model fit the data itself. So that's just what I wanted to show here. Um, so some of the learnings we had from this time series prediction work is that statistical methods are good to go with. They are very quick to process, very quick to write, uh, but they do depend on seasonality in your data. And there is a lot of pre-work you have to do. So there is a lot of parameter search you have to do for all the global variables you set in a statistical uh, model. Um, and these can influence the predictions you make. In LSTMs, they are able to pick up seasonality patterns given more data sets, uh, but you do need more years. So now we are experimenting with two years or three years of data as well, but there's a lot of tri trial and error. Um, so again, it's a scaling problem because working, we just don't have one link we're working with. So what we're doing next to answer your question is to actually build a bigger LSTM model. So we're trying to go down this route of a graph based LSTM where we have multiple uh, inputs and multiple outputs and try to just see if we could uh, improve our predictions that way. Then we just have one model to train. We're also thinking of adding features such as conference deadlines uh, into this, such as at the time around SC or other big HPC uh, conferences to see if that could influence uh, the model predictions. But again, hyperparameter optimization is an issue and this, there needs to be more work happening at the lab in this area, uh, just in general. So yeah. Um, so now that we've done the, the various analysis and we've got like 140 different models, we wanted to actually deploy them in the wild and test them out with real network traffic. So um, this is a typical machine learning life cycle where we've got the data, we've trained the models, and now we've evaluated them and it's best. So now we want to deploy those models into production. The problem we have is that AI is expensive. Network devices don't have very powerful compute attached to them. They're not an HPC facility. Um, so the machine learning algorithms also need to be tested. So yeah, so this is a common problem we found. So traditionally, machine learning research is trained and tested on historical data sets. And that's how you evaluate how good your machine learning is doing. Our networks change constantly every day. So we want to see how good the machine learning algorithms are doing in real time. So we're trying to test our models in real time. Uh, model inference is also a challenge because our uh, devices don't have a long time to wait. So the inference time has to be reduced as much as possible. Um, so adding more layers will uh, increase the inference time of a model as well. So those are things which we have to consider if we want to actually deploy these machine learning uh, uh, techniques in, in the models. So, our goal is to productionize the machine learning we're doing, monitor how well the models are, are performing, and also how well they're performing real-time data coming in, data which they've never seen before. Uh, we need a standard way to deploy models, such as a plug-and-play technique, where we can have APIs attached to different models, and you can switch different models at different times, and also want a scalable support uh, for many tools to access these models. So the way we did this is we built uh, this on Google Cloud. So we needed a system where we could have much more of a real-time streaming kind of a technique where we could ping and get access to APIs. We deployed the machine learning models here and monitored their performance. We have a centralized model hub. We can perform real-time predictions. So it takes in what the real-time data is and then feeds it into our model and does an inference and sees what the next predictions are gonna look like. And you can also compare multiple models in uh, together. So one model is giving you one performance, but you can have another chart showing performance of another model. So you can actually switch in and out between different models. One thing we did, we kind of cheated uh, in a way to bring our costs down because we pre-trained all our models on Rancium and NERSC. So, and then we basically just saved the M5 files and then loaded, the, loaded them into Google Cloud. So that's how we kind of saved the costs of actually training uh, a model. Can you tell me roughly how big was this cloud? Yeah, I'm gonna go into the details now. So the way the system architecture works, uh, we have a lot of ESNet monitoring tools which are hooked into a streaming engine which was designed in Firebase. So this is much more like an online uh, data-based system. And um, multiple devices can be feeding into the streaming thing. So that's how we're getting the data. 
You also have pre-saved data, which is uh, in the offline phase where you have a data lake and you can train different models using that. But you can also update the models you've trained using a certain schedule uh, with the real-time data which is coming in. So once your pre-trained models have also been updated, you could save them into a model repo, which is uh, cloud buckets, uh, which we used here. Once the cloud, uh, the model is done, trained, what we did was we used cloud functions uh, to load those models up as an API. So when the data came in, it called those cloud, uh, uh, so when a data came in, the cloud function ran and it called the model as an API to produce the predictions. So those predictions were offered to our service, which was NetPredict and other automation services. But you can also have a performance monitor or a trust dashboard uh, which is running in the background to see how well your predictions are performing with the real-time data which is coming in. So it's um, um, so so I have a few slides where I go into more detail of this. Um, so the system features we built in are flexible time scales. You can set up different times at which you want the models to be updated. It's scalable. Uh, so the inference time had to be so if we if we had one cloud function which was uh, doing the inference for all 140, it was taking a half an hour. So the way we scaled it out was have 140 cloud functions for everything, which reduce the time by, uh, by uh, ma magnitudes. So we can, this gives us the option of scaling the functions in and out with the number of devices we are working with. We pre-trained those models, so we saved a lot of t uh, money on that and had intelligent API, so we could set up alarms that if one particular machine learning model is not doing well, it would swap it out with another one that was performing well at that time. And this way we can provide automation services. So now if we want to compute real-time predictions, such as get the least congested path in real time, it can actually uh, go through this process and bring up the results. So this is a screenshot of our service, which was demoed at uh, SC in research exhibitions. Uh, so, uh, what uh, it has is right now, so you can define a source and a destination here. So we put in LBNL in Denver, so this is kind of like a drop down thing. Uh, once you do that, it gives you the next 24 hour predictions over here. And then based on the different hours you click, it gives you the alternative paths as well. So it gives you the least congested path in that hour if you want to schedule your transfer during that time. Uh, it also works out how long your transfer will take if you were to choose this particular slot. So it gives you like an end time for, uh, for your thing. So, and we found that at certain times, there might be other paths which would be the least congested ones. So we can actually do uh, better path routing decisions this way. Because right now, so with this, we're actually making decisions based on what we predict the congestion is rather than the standard network uh, routing algorithms. So this is a, a, a very different way in, in which how we can decide routing decisions in the network. So this screen also links into a trust dashboard. So we want to, so if we show this to the network engineers and if they want to use this, they want to see if their machine learning models are actually performing well before they can actually make operational decisions. So uh, we have, so the, the screen actually links into a trust dashboard where you can compare different deep learning models and their mean square error over time. So again, this is all real time. So you can grab, uh, so this will show what the real time data is and how your models are performing right now. Um, you can test different models together. You can put them together and you can also see that certain models who actually perform very well at, on certain days are deviating as they go forward. So this is again because network traffic is quite uh, random and we have different behaviors. So at that time we can see that maybe another model actually starts performing better and we can sw swap it out. Okay, yes. So we have multiple models, but all those models will also get updated with the data from last day. From real time. Yeah. yeah. And still some of them will deviate and some of them will keep running. Yeah. Deviation is predicting for <coughs> yeah. like each day you're only predicting the next day or the next hour or something. Yeah, predicting forward. So with real-time data, this is what I predict forward. And then you measure the mean square 
error with what I predicted and what was reality. And that's how you measure how good your model was performing. I guess the question is for like, um, are you predicting several steps in the future? Then you leave those alone and see how well it does as the future becomes the present, or like you just predict one time step and then at that one the model is updated and predicts the next time step. Yeah, so that so we're so it's kind of like a backward looking thing. So this model was performing very bad, uh, very nicely with yesterday's data. So there is a backwards, there is a dependency on when real data has come in. You want to measure how good your model. Yeah, so it's actually looking back because now you have the real data. So with I guess you. what he's really asking, you predict the 24 hours in advance, right? Yeah. And you update the model every hour, right? No, uh, yes, yeah. Right, so they're doing a one hour time step and keeping a 24 hour loop, right? So that's sort of what he meant. Um, and you are saying that the model is good if it predicted just the next hour or the whole 24 hours? So right now, this graph, the trust dashboard, is next hour. Uh, we want to push it to 24 hours. So that's current work right now. Um, so the, uh, the, the good thing is that the flexibility of this kind of an infrastructure is huge. Uh, we can hook into any ESNet tool or device. We can scale to as many devices or any changes, even if they do on the side of things. So this can exist as a completely independent system which just hooks into what uh, engineering decisions are being made. You can also try out new models as research matures. Uh, we see that we might have a very good time series prediction model today and tomorrow someone will come and say that my model is better. So this allows us to basically easily switch different models in and out and work with real world challenges. So we're connecting to various ESNet devices but this kind of Infrastructure also allows us to tap into IoT networks and IoT sensors. So we can do the same work which we've done for ESNet devices with IoT networks. And that is one of the areas in which we are also expanding in. Now, the cost is a big problem when you work with uh, a commercial clouds. Um, we have a lot of expertise. I am a software engineer myself. Our team has a lot of software engineers as well. We played around with a lot of cloud services to actually bring the cost down. So we experimented with uh, different Redis databases and other uh, databases. And we tried out different things to actually bring the cost down. So this whole infrastructure now runs for $10 per week. And I, can, I have to manage, monitor this because I'm actually charging this to my project. Uh, so I cannot afford to pay like multiple dollars per, per month. Now, the, the, the advantage of doing this is that this makes a very good case for the facilities because I can then take it up to the facilities and say this is only going to cost you $10 if we were to provide this service to users to use. Um, the hardest part of all of this, uh, so again, the inference time is, pro is problematic. We, so it's not only just the machine learning training and the, uh, the accuracy of the machine learning models, but we also have to reduce the inference time. Because you can imagine users or engineers using this service and they don't have a lot of time to wait for the machine learning model to finish running. Uh, converting all the code to cloud functions is, is good. And there is an additional uh, criteria that cloud functions have to finish within nine minutes. So all of your code has to be optimized to finish within nine minutes uh, if you are using cloud functions. If we go down the route of using virtual machines, these are very expensive on GCP. And then we, yeah, we played around with different cloud services and uh, various database models. Um, so ESNet also has a NetBeam project, so they have a lot of expertise on how we can optimize how GCP can be used. And Peter was uh, part of this team to do this as well. Um, uh, now what we can do is, so this infrastructure is now deployed, so we can train per ESNet link or even site. We can train hundreds of individual models. We can bootstrap them with real-time data coming in. Uh, we can automatically update these models uh, whenever we want and offer many services. And yeah, we're also expanding to IoT sensors. So, uh, so this is my last slide. Um, so we have been running simulations to see whether uh, using congestion information can improve the traffic. And we have found that there should be a 30% improvement if and in lesser congestion points if we were to do transfers based on what our time series prediction algorithms are giving us. 
So this works very well with simulations. So now what we're going to do is we're going to start doing this in testing in a production network. So we're interfacing with Oscars, which is another ESNet tool, which allows you to set up virtual links. Um, so what we're going to do is that Oscars will take in information which the time series prediction algorithms are giving to actually uh, set up those paths rather than using the standard routing algorithms which Oscar uses. So we're working with a lot of ESNet engineers to actually get some time on the production network where we can safely do these experiments. Uh, working with commercial clouds um, has its advantages. So we had the situation where there was a power outage during SC and a lot of demos failed because a lot of the devices were turned off because our demo was hosted on GCP. We didn't have that issue. And that is something which doesn't get uh, noted enough that to have that kind of a capability because again, services have to be kept online and running and how can we work if we try to, so we do want to explore if there are an in-house uh, um, solutions for this, but uh, these are things which we also have to think about. So ongoing work, we are continuing to work in deep learning models to improve predictions. Uh, we also have a very strong uh, stream of work happening in deep reinforcement learning and control optimization. Uh, so we're also using those techniques to actually uh, allow network controllers to learn as they interact with the network. Uh, we're working on improving how the trust dashboard works so that it adds confidence in our machine learning predictions and also interfacing with other ESNet data sources. So right now we can take in the inputs from SNMP data sets, but you can also superlace it with other data sources, which are normally not combined and then make your predictions uh, with multiple data sources. So this would not be possible with this amazing team. So we, I don't work alone, uh, but we also have a lot of acknowledgements from ESNet engineers who are constantly supporting the work we do. And that is it. The uh, app, which I showed is actually hosted on this website. So if anybody wants to go and play with it, please do. <laughs>